The welfare of the farmer is a basic need of this nation. It is the men from the farm who in the past have taken the lead in every great movement within this nation, whether in time of war or in time of peace. It is well to have our cities prosper, but it is not well if they prosper at the expense of the country. In this movement, the lead must be taken by the farmer themselves, but our people as a whole, through their governmental agencies, should back the farmer. Everything possible should be done to better the economic condition of the farmer and also to increase the social value of the life of the farmer, the farmer's wife and their children. The burdens of labor and loneliness bear heavily on the women in the country. Their welfare should be the especial concern of all of us. Everything possible should be done to make life in the country profitable so as to be attractive from the economic standpoint. And there should be just the same chance to live as full, as well-rounded, and as highly useful lives in the country as in the city. The story of Milford Township's District 50 school begins in far-off Washington, D.C. in January 1909. Only two months before he left office, President Theodore Roosevelt held one of the most important meetings in American history. The Conference on Country Life initiated changes that reverberate even today. As the United States was becoming increasingly urban, popular writers lamented that America's rural youth were leaving the countryside in unprecedented numbers to make new lives in the city. One report explained the seriousness of what they called the rural problem. The great changes of the past 20 years, which have marked the urbanization of rural life, have also had their effect on the little country school. With the hundreds of new interests which have been brought home to country people, and the wider contact with people and with life, the old type of rural school education has ceased to satisfy as it once did. With the new interests entering the home and the decline in importance of the church, new problems in moral as well as intellectual education have come to the front. The inadequacy of the old book education is gradually becoming apparent, and it is seen that the education of children must involve the moral and physical, as well as a new type of the intellectual. The Country Life Movement was led by the Commission's chairman, a charismatic young professor from Cornell University, Liberty Hyde Bailey. Author of several books on rural life, his views influenced the generation. Agriculture was not a technical profession, he said, or merely an industry. It was a civilization. While the Country Life Conference made many recommendations, the country school, where the next impressionable generation would be educated and trained, became its focal point. As Modern Farming Magazine says in this article, the traction engine carries a headlight, making night work possible. The automobile shows another phase of farm development. The rural schoolhouse in this district is as it was 25 years ago and the equipment and course of study are not any better. According to the Country Life Movement, the little one-room schoolhouse was inefficient and should be consolidated with other larger schools. If rural schools were to remain open, their buildings would need to be modernized and the three R courses taught in a way to be practical to the future farmer. Over the next decade, Congress would pass significant reform legislation. It created a system of county agricultural agents. It funded the establishment of agriculture and home economic departments in high schools. And it developed a plan for boys and girls clubs, which by 1920 became known as 4-H clubs. Minnesota stood at the forefront of progressive educational reform. And for rural schools, the first step would be to change the way that they were built, since the state could offer money for the right kind of construction. Although aimed at eliminating one-room schools, 
the new education standards found their way into rural areas through widespread distribution of plan books based on designs published in the annual reports of the superintendent of public instruction. In 1910, just a year after the Country Life Commission met in Washington, Minnesota's superintendent of public instruction commissioned Minneapolis architect Frank Halden to create standard plans for one- and two-room schoolhouses, published in the book Rural and Consolidated School Buildings in Minnesota. At the same time, the citizens of District 50 in Milford Township, encompassing the area east of and including the unincorporated town of Essig, were debating whether to build a new school. The surrounding farms were owned by families, most of them children or grandchildren of the German immigrants who first settled in the area a half century earlier. The school itself typically had around 30 students drawn from the surrounding farms, bringing brothers and sisters, cousins, and close neighbors together in the classroom. Because Essig had a railroad stop, it had better financial resources than most of the other rural school districts in Brown County, with several stores, a grain elevator, and a lumber yard contributing tax dollars. In March 1912, the citizens of District 50 voted to build a new school. There was controversy, with nearly half the voters opposing the new construction. A few farmers petitioned to create a new district to the east so their children would not have to walk as far. That petition was rejected. Moving ahead, the school board selected one of the standard plans that the state had just published. In fact, it came right off the book's cover. The plan, which remains remarkably intact, is an adaptation of the Minnesota Standard School Plan, design number two. Samuel Chalman, director of the state's school buildings division, noted this design has proved to be the most popular in the state and is one of the two original plans prepared by the Department of Education. It employed many of the latest trends. One was the use of a wall of windows, with its location based on prevailing winds and afternoon sun. This improved the health of the students by providing sunlight and good ventilation. Inside, the front of the room would be placed on the north, so that the sunlight would shine on students' desks from the left, making sure that it wouldn't be blocked when students wrote. This, of course, assumed, as most did, that you should be right-handed. There would be a library where children would have a quiet space to read. And, as the state manual recommended, the coat room and the vestibule should never be combined as children's clothing should be kept in a warm room where there is a constant circulation of air. To manage construction, the school board hired Herman Ummy, who had gained a reputation as one of Brown County's best architects. His buildings include the Berg Hotel in Sleepy Eye and the Banger Building in downtown New Ulm. The work proceeded quickly, and the school opened in October 1912. It would serve the district for 59 years. The story of the school, however, always comes back to the students, the ones who received their early education within its walls. We spent a lot of time in Essig because my grandmother had a store there. Okay. So all the while that I grew up, we spent, uh, I visited her at least every day and would help her in her store, which is maybe what led to my interest in retail now. Um, but, and what was her store? And she had the general store, okay. general store. Um, and she lived on the farm right next to ours, also right across the road here. Um, but she lived there. Um, it, 
earlier before my time, my grandfather had a bar there, and prior to that, my great-grandfather lived there and had a, a lumberyard there. So we've had a lot of generations in Essig. Yeah. <laughs> and at that time in Essig, when I was a young kid, there was still uh, a post office, there was a general store, there was um, a hardware store, there was a garage, there were churches, there were you know lots of things there that slowly evaporated over time. Now, what churches were in town? Um, there was originally a Lutheran church and, uh, and uh, Frieden's Evangelical Church, and eventually in both cases they merged into New Alm. So I never attended church in Essex. They had already okay. merged by then. How many were there in your, each of your classes? Just how many? How many? It started out with three, okay. and then in, in fourth grade, we one of them went to town to be in parochial school. So then it was just myself and another another guy, okay. just wow. the two of us. Okay. You know, I don't remember any of my classmates. However, I know by the time I was in seventh grade, everyone else had started school in New Ulm, so I was the only one in seventh grade. Wow. How come you had to stay here? Parental choice. Okay. And there were six of mine. Six? Mm -hmm. wow. Six girls. Wow. Okay. That was a big class. That must have been a really, pretty big class. So, how did the teacher balance six different grades? I think some of them we had together. Some we had together, classes. but I know the first, the little one sat on that side. Yeah. Okay. First, you know, second, the older one sat on this side. And then when we were studying, she'd do things with them. Okay. You know, there was a big table right here. Oh, okay. And she'd put the, that class, whoever it was, yeah. around that table. Okay. And then we would be doing homework mm -hmm. or studying or whatever, reading. Yeah, okay. Tests. <laughs> And I think, too, one advantage of having those different classes mm -hmm. together, the younger ones would be listening yeah. to the older ones and absorb. So probably the teaching was a little easier because of that, that factor. Yeah. The younger ones just absorbing what the older ones were hearing. Yeah. And maybe the learning was easier for some of them, too. Mm -hmm. Repeat. Mm -hmm. Sure, because you just be hearing lessons over, over and over, over. each year. Well, kids remember easier, so when they're little, they come back the next year. I remember that from last year. Mm. <laughs> I know that answer. Yeah. Was there a pecking order with age? Like, by the time you were in sixth grade, did you sort of rule the roost a little bit over the little ones? Or do you remember that all? I no, know. everybody really got along well. Mm -hmm. You know, and there was... I, I, I just remember there were a, a, a few, you know, there, there, there's always one or two people that everybody kind of gangs up on. Mm -hmm. But over, you know, other than that, overall, everybody got along very well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, your teachers, uh, how many did you have in your time? How many teachers came through, through during your... According to my report cards, three. Three, okay. Was just one stand out in your memory? Mrs. Manderfelt, the last one. Okay. Mrs. Storm does. I don't remember Mrs. Croft. Okay. I remember her, Mrs. Croft and Mrs. Wagoner. And, um, and, then, uh, and then we had um, Helen Schrader, mm. who later became the superintendent of schools after Frank Heck resigned. But she taught here prior to becoming superintendent of the, of the rural schools. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. She must have been quite an interesting. She was wonderful. I liked her very did much. You? Yeah, Mrs. Schrader. She was a beautiful lady. Very, very pretty. So why did you like her? What was it about her? I think she was more understanding. Of, of the kids, not less of a disciplinarian necessarily, but just a little bit more understanding. I think sometimes the rural school teachers could be 
a little more narrow. Mm -hmm. But she she was not. She was from the city too. Correct. Yeah. Was that? Okay. Mm -hmm. So you think that made a little bit of a difference? A little more experience working with different types of children. Yeah. She probably felt sorry for us. <laughs> <laughs> I was a, a good speller, mm -hmm. uh, for a boy anyway, and so I was in the fourth grade and there was a girl in the eighth grade yeah. and we always had the top scores usually on Fridays. Yeah. It was kind of a competition between us. Yeah. And we had, right on that wall, we had little paper squirrels hanging Huh. with a string down huh. and if you got a hundred on your spelling test yeah. you cut a little nut out and you'd pull it on the string really? well one Friday I screwed up and I didn't get a hundred uh -huh. and of course Norma the eighth grader she got a hundred yeah. so then a day or two later when it was recess yeah. I came running in here and I quick cut a nut and put it on the string well the teacher caught it and of course then I caught hell of course I can't remember what the repercussions were but <laughs> I didn't I didn't want to you know I didn't want to be beaten by an eighth grade girl <laughs>
older kids, you know, would be the pitchers, but um, we played on that rock all the time. Big furnace back there, where that spot did, is did on the floor. Did it blow up or just the furnace was hot and it heated it just cold hot. building then? It was just hot. We used to bring potatoes, we wrapped paper, uh, potatoes in foil, put them on top. And then there was a reservoir on top with water and we'd bring soup in jars. Oh, okay. What did, you had different things that you brought, I think, right? Yeah, whatever was at home that was left over, you know, wrap it up and throw it up there and it was it good to go. It smelled wonderful by about Yeah, <laughs> 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 We're sitting at the desk. I thought so But too. I think everybody kind of did what they wanted. Mm -hmm. I remember going outside even and eating. Out in the porch. We, we didn't, we, yeah, we didn't, we weren't, you know, reprimanded to sit at a table and eat. We could eat kind of where we We ate at our desks because remember Kurt Lombricht? I remember him, but what are you going to um, he always sat, and we had this little hole yeah. in our desk, and he would always put his ketchup bottle in there because he ate ketchup bread. Okay. <laughs> it was cool. Mm, I don't and we, remember that. And we had soaked through jelly bread or molasses I bread. I was telling him they him that year before. <laughs> you told him that? Yeah. Jelly bread, you molasses bread? You put oh, no. <laughs> Sometimes we'd have molasses on our bread. And it would be soaked all the way through. By the time noon came, it was pretty bad. What? When you're hungry? Mm -hmm. Hey, it we tasted didn't know good. different. <laughs> Oh yeah, that was on my list to tell you about because that was one of the most scary things. And I must have been probably first or second grade, yes. maybe. And you know, and I was shy and I was quiet. Yeah. But the older kids got to make a haunted house area in mm -hmm. the basement. And they made you go through there blindfolded. <laughs> And I know now, I mean, I know, knew afterwards what it was, but they made you touch things, and one of them was liver, cold, raw liver. And they tell you, I don't remember what they said it was, but I'll for, forever remember that. It was down in this corner over there that they had it. And I, I, I was scared. I, you know, I was little. Yeah. I, they did, but we had to do it, and I, you know, Maybe I was even older and still scared, I'm not sure. <laughs> felt was really wonderful. I remember uh -huh. uh, at Christmas time, we always had a Christmas program. Okay. And that's why the curtain was there. Yeah. They, the school board would come in and put a stage up. Mm -hmm. And Mrs. Manderfelt had two daughters that were in dance and she had costumes for everybody, and we played Tonette. Remember that? Yep. Um, you played Tonette. Tonette. I, I have no idea what that is. It's kind of like it's a kind of like a clarinet, only it's about it's only oh, oh, they're only about short. six inches yeah, long. Yeah, yeah. I still have they, mine. They have, yeah, they have. Yeah. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. <laughs> row, row, row your boat. Oh, the piano is right here. Yep, in the corner. Okay. And then um, at the end, Santa would come and we'd all get a brown bag. It had peanuts and it's an on apple the on the bottom. An apple and then a bag, bag of candy. Mm -hmm. And the old, <laughs> the old twist, remember the big twist the of ribbon. the raspberries? Mm -hmm. Hard raspberries. candy. Hard candy. Yep, it was all hard candy. The, the good old time spice, yeah. you know, like clove. and yeah. You can't find that anymore. There'd be peanuts in there. Runnings. Peanuts are on the bottom. We're all, always on the bottom. Next nuts. And there was a big yeah. red apple. Yeah. And then the, the bag of hard candy. Okay. That was always so much fun. And you sang some songs on the Sunday. Oh yeah. We had program. a program, but I don't remember quite. We had it. We had a dance we part. We did. And we had the tonette part, and um, so we sang. I think that was it. That's all I remember. Yeah was fun and fantastic. Oh, it was the best time of the whole year. <laughs> the, um, the dads would come in. Well, first, the, 
the desks would be pulled up to the front, but eventually the dads would come in and actually haul the desks out of the school um, because um, the whole back half of the school was built with a stage and the curtain is still there. We've probably seen it already. Um, the basement was divided up into dressing rooms with what appeared to us to be rows and rows of elaborate costumes, you know. And we had a series of skits and songs and and pieces, as they were called back then, which was kind of a, a poem or something like that that you'd have read. And, and every kid had multiple things to do in, in the show. And, you know, you know, when I think back, I mean, they seemed like, wonderful, exotic, you know, fabulous things, but it was, you know, canoes built out of cardboard. And, but, you know, as kids, we were really involved in the whole construction and painting of it. We were involved in practicing for it and learning things for it. And, and so actually it was a really good learning activity and it was actually a pretty good fine arts activity. You know, we learned how to act and we learned how to sing and we learned how to speak in front of public audiences and, you know, we learned how to be the MC as we got older and, you know, there were a lot of things that we had opportunities to do in a small group of kids that we might not have, I mean, I, I don't have that great a singing voice and I had at least a solo every year and a duet probably too, you know, <laughs> where I probably would have never had that opportunity in a bigger, a bigger group of kids. <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, and they moved the desk up because of course this was jam packed with uh, chairs for all the parents and grandparents and people from Essex to come and Santa visited and there were bags of treats. Big line you had, Oh, I remember, I would, I would love to have a videotape because it would be ridiculous now, but I remember being dressed as a Christmas tree and singing O Tannenbaum, my first foray into a foreign language. Wow. Well, maybe, maybe best left to the imagination. I think it was it, better remembered yeah, than it was. It becomes wonderful there and you can never take that uh, exactly. and break it down. <laughs> So a few times, a few times the school picnic actually fell on my birthday because we always had that after school closed. Okay, that was sort of your closing event for the school right. each for, school year? For the school, yeah, for the school year and it actually was for the whole district and I mean okay. mostly it was parents of course who came, mm -hmm. grandparents, you know, but it was actually for the whole district and it was a potluck and um, the interesting thing was they always cooked um, wieners. They would get, you know, wieners from, well, I can tell you even where they got them. They got them from Schnobricks in, in, in New Ulm. And then they would take them, and that's, this was the school board's job, and they would take them up to Essig and they would steam them in the creamery. Oh in a milk can. So they serve these these wieners out of a milk can. <laughs> but they were they were just delicious, you know, how you think back, I, I suppose they were just like any other wiener. No, but no, no, you know no but they were, you know, they were good. And then and then they'd always make um, and this was always up to the school board too, mm. made fresh squeezed lemonade. Mm. And Radliff's had the lemon squeezer for it. We had a good time walking. I'll never forget, I had a red coat. And remember stock camps? They lived across by the slough. Mm -hmm. The boys used to go ahead. And I was really little. I probably was in first grade. Mm -hmm. And um, they'd always say, hurry up, the bull's going to get you. <laughs> and then um, when Myron and I, I don't know, you weren't, that must have been before you came, we used to walk home and we always had to, we walked home on that side and to school on this side and we used to pick ditches. We found the, the coolest things in the ditch. Uh, one thing See, I remember is, fun. one thing I remember it was a yellow can and it was full of salted peanuts in packages, yeah. Mr. Salty or Mr. whatever it was. We took that home. We didn't tell Ma what was inside. We ate them all. 
<laughs> and, and a lot of times we'd have people that would stop and give us a ride, mm -hmm. and we'd go. Okay. You weren't, you didn't have certain, I mean, not well, supposed to accept rides. So. Well, in those Back days, then, in those days, there was not that. The danger. We didn't worry about that at all. If someone offered you a ride, mm -hmm. you were fine in the yeah. country here. Yeah. There was no problem. And we did get a lot of rides. Mm -hmm. okay. We did, occasionally. Lunchtime. We would go over to the, you know, the kids that were our classmates. Yeah. Um, I remember the Martys, we'd go over there, and, okay. and the Housers and Windschittles. Yeah. We'd go, because I remember at Dave's, they milked cows, and of course, they drank the cow's milk right from the yeah. cooler. Yeah. And of course, the kids over there, they liked it warm right from the cow, and I just, I could never do that. But it just was not a good flavor for me. But, and then we actually went into uh, Mrs. Manderfelt would have us kids over like on a Saturday or something, and we would do stuff at her place with her kids and yeah. stuff like that. And she was an awesome person. Yeah. Unreal. Yep. Anyway, there was only two new kids the year I went. Myself and a girl, mm -hmm. and then in the ninth grade, then all the Lutheran kids came. Oh. So then we went. There was about probably 25, 30 of them. Okay. So we ended up. We started out with about 100, 122 kids. Yeah. And by the time we graduated, we were down to like 104. Okay. So. Okay. Was that a little bit of culture shock going from your? Oh, it Small was like school to the big school. Oh yeah, it was like going to New York City. That's <laughs> and then it, I don't know if you're familiar with that school, but yeah. <clears throat> the halls angle in one section of it. Yeah. <clears throat> I could not, I could not get used in my head how they angled, mm -hmm. and I continually got lost. And then at that time there was a, the old school was there, which was called the Emerson School. Yeah. And we had like music and different some classes in there oh, okay. and there was a tunnel you could walk through to get to that school mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> but it took me the better part of the first year to get used to that angled hall in there got it nothing but problems with that but finally you know you eventually get used to it yeah. repetition will, will do a lot of things you know yeah yeah so what was the difference between a, a country boy and somebody who was lived in new home oh there there was quite a bit of difference uh -huh. They were, you know, pretty worldly, and we were pretty hokey <laughs> out here in Boondocks. Worldly in New Orleans. World, yeah, well, worldly in New Orleans, yeah. <laughs> yeah, hell, that was a big city. <laughs> I remember one noon, of uh -huh. course, naturally, we didn't like the school food. Okay. So one noon, I walked down to the Purity White uh, uh -huh. hamburger place, uh -huh. which was, uh, well, beside the city hall, kind of. no. Well, yeah, I was beside the city hall okay. and had a hamburger and left. Instead of turning right and walking up the hill, I turn left and I end up down by the power plant. Oh. And now I'm scared because I'm going to be late. <laughs> yeah. I think I ran all the way up the hill. <laughs> I don't remember how late I was, but I know that was, that was terrible. Well, that's, the city was so damn big. What could you do? You know, yeah. you had to get lost. Yeah. But then later on, there was a place called Tubbies, and it was kind of a 50s atmosphere. Yeah, okay. And then we had we had malts and burgers and stuff there. And mm -hmm. A lot of times we went there to eat instead yeah. of eating at the school because we didn't like the school food. Legislators and educators continued to push for an end to small rural schools. Despite the carrots of increased state financial assistance, rural areas held tight to the old system. As late as 1947, Minnesota had more than 7,600 districts. But the decline was dramatic over the following two decades. By 1965, there were fewer than 1,800 school districts in all of Minnesota. Among the biggest roadblocks to reform were the stubborn farmers of Brown County. The death knell came on May 24, 1967, when the state legislature passed the Duty to Maintain Grades K-12 through statute. 
This piece of legislation called for the elimination of all districts that did not maintain their own secondary schools. In late May 1971, Brown County's rural schools closed for the last time, an event recorded in an article in the New Ulm Daily Journal. It said, Under state law, all country public schools must close their doors for good after the present term, ending an era that touched the lives of nearly every rural resident in the county today. The thinking behind the law is that the old-fashioned facilities do not offer the necessary opportunities to today's youth. Any of you old-timers care to challenge that? One year after the District 50 school closed, it was purchased by the township. And as a town hall, it continues to serve as a hub for community life. In 2016, it was listed in the National Register of Historic Places. the schools closed we used this as our 4-H building also then oh, you did. and I was in 4-H yeah. and which was wonderful it was amazing yeah. and it was all the different farm families and we would meet once once a month on a Monday night mm -hmm. here at the town hall and it was full we had a it was a brand new 4-H group mm -hmm. and it was the Milford 4-H Country Club and yeah. we were it was a lot of fun it was yeah yeah so what did you do with 4-H? I was, I was um, probably about 12, 11, 12 when that started. Yeah. So I held every office there um, and I loved, I loved being able to conduct meetings and do the skits and then afterwards we would have, we'd have fun with, um, there was always a family that was in charge that month of, of an activity, yeah. like we had apple bobbing or we would play different games. I remember one time we had to pass an orange underneath our chin to the next person. We had a relay race. And then after that, there was always a family that was in charge then of, of a meal, of a little snack then also. But it was just, it was neat because it was always the, all the farm families around here. And at that time, it just seemed like you were always together with those families. Like on Sundays in the wintertime, all, there was many different families that would get together and all of us would go snowmobiling together. You know, like uh, Charlie and, yeah. and uh, Freddie Uni and um, Elmer Gugisberg and Davy Uni and Galen Bodie and Jean Roloff. All of those families had snowmobiles. So usually a husband and a wife, they usually had two snowmobiles. But then on the, the kids, they would have some type of a, a sled on the back. And my dad could make anything. So and almost all the men had a sled that they would pull their kids in on the back. And it was so much fun. And then we'd have a wiener roast in the woods. And we just, it was always, you were always together with families and your neighbors. And now it just seems like sometimes you don't even know your neighbors anymore. Yeah. But, you know, 4-H brought the neighborhood together because yeah. then you'd have a 4-H club picnic in the, in the um, summertime where you would go to like about seven different farms mm -hmm. and, they would, and, the, and the person in 4-H would show what they're working on for 4-H. It might, be, might have been a horse or a flower garden yeah. and so forth. Um, so you're always together. You learned your basics, not Better. not like not like now. Yeah. I mean, have you ever gone in the grocery store and the and the cash register, the computers are down? Yeah. You buy something for a buck and yeah. something else for a dollar twenty-five, and you give them a five, and mm -hmm. they are totally lost if they have to make change manually. <laughs> they don't know how. Mm -hmm. They can't do it. We we learned the three R's real well. Okay. I think so too. Mm -hmm. That was important. Mm -hmm. And when I went to started eighth grade in town, yeah. I wasn't behind okay. as far as any of my classes. Yeah. They were no further ahead of me than... Just socially, we were probably a little behind. True, but as far as the elementary things of education. Yeah, education. Socially, what is that? What do you mean by that? You know what, what I mean by socially, they just live different in the city than what we did in the country. Okay. No, I think we had a better advantage in the big schools, you know, because the older kids would work with us and coddle us and, you know, help us, and you'd learn from them. 
versus when you went to the public school, you were all the same age, you know, and stuff. And and recesses, you know, you'd play with the bigger kids and participate with them. Yeah. Um, you got a lot more hands-on. I, th I think we were more advanced because you were with older kids and you'd learn, yeah. you'd probably learn things sooner than you were supposed to maybe, yeah. you know, but, uh, yeah. but I, I think it was a great experience. I think it's, sometimes I wish the times were back there. <laughs> so I think our world would be better.